don't know what that means, but... Uh, <laughs> Just well, in case you want to run for president. Yeah, well, I'm not old enough yet. <laughs> yes. Nowadays, you have to be in your 70s. Also, not a job I think I would want. You know, you have to watch what you say. Yes. yes. Always. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. A little bit softer. Softer. Okay. The first time I spoke to San Viviano was in 2004. I was living in Paris. I was about to go to bed when suddenly the phone rang. It was already midnight, so I wondered who the hell was calling at this hour. I pick up the phone, real piece off, trying to figure out how kind of moron would want to sell me something. And at that time of night, I was ready for the worst when a warm voice greeted me. Hi, Leonardo. It's Sam Viviano from Mad Magazine. And you can already imagine the rest. But let me start from the beginning. <laughs> Sam Viviano was born in Detroit and he studied at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, earning a degree in fine arts until his vagabond shoes, they were long due to stray. So he drove up the East Coast to New York. What did he do to earn his life? cartoons, abstract expressionist paintings, textile designs. He was working on Scholastic magazine, but he was still missing something. He featured his caricatures at the Bibles of Illustration, Showcase and Black Book. He kept trying until he succeeded in advertising illustration. He dropped for the first time in Mad Magazine fighting the first round on 1981. So four years and six fingers later, he won the second round by KO. If he could make it there, he will make it anywhere. So he did it during all those years as a contributor and became later Mad Art Director. Sam won the prestigious National Cartoonist Society Award for Best Magazine Illustration in 2009. In 2014, he was in inducted into the Media Industry News Design Hall of Fame. In 2017, after 65 years in New York, Mad Magazine moved to Burbank and Sam stayed to still wake up in the city that doesn't sleep with the rest of the gang. The mad New York offices were melted away while Joey Raiola was singing his particular version of My Way through a shower of fruits, papers and cakes <laughs> and holding Bill Gaines' spirit in the very heart of it. It's been three years now and Matt is still alive and kicking in California. San Viviano became my collaborator again, as at the beginning. Will he make a brand new start of it again? Only he knows, it's up to him. Anyway, Sam, thanks for that call 17 years ago and for letting me be a little part of it. Welcome, Sam. You're very welcome and th thank you for answering the call. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a real story. It's a real story because I always hate the, the telephone ringing. It's well, always like know, that. I, I don't think I realized that you were living in Paris at the time. And I assume that you were in Caracas and then therefore around the same time as we had in New York. I, I didn't realize I was calling <laughs> you at midnight. <laughs> Yes, it was midnight. <laughs> it was midnight. Yes, yes. Uh, it makes me even happier that you answered the phone. <laughs> Look what it led to. <laughs> eh, yo le estaba estaba haciendo la presentación de Sam y, y estaba haciendo un poco un pequeño un resumen muy muy compacto de su carrera y estaba jugando un poco con la con la letra en inglés de la canción New York, New York. 
porque yo encuentro que cuando yo, esa canción quizá tiene que ver mucho con él porque él vino de Detroit y fue a Nueva York a triunfar, ¿no? Y un poco ese proceso. Y, y también recordando el momento en que me llamó la primera vez en el, en el año 2004, en que yo vivía en Francia, y al final eh, volví a agradecerle esa llamada. Eso en resumen fue un poco lo que, lo que hablamos aquí, lo que yo le estaba contando. So, what was your motivation for moving to New York? Oh, well, you have to realize that this was 40, almost 45 years ago. Um, and in those days, before social media, internet existed at all, it really was helpful, particularly if you were starting out, to be where the work was. And in the States, the work was in New York. It was the center of the publishing world. It was the center of the advertising world. And uh, also, I had visited New York a couple of times as a teenager and fell in love with it. It's really where I wanted to be. It was like, I always said, it was like the Emerald City uh, in The Wizard of Oz. You, it, you just had to go. So. Uh, as soon as I graduated from college, I packed up and I moved to New York. Uh, fortunately, I had relatives who lived in Brooklyn, so I was able to stay with them for about a half a year while I got started. Usually, um, we, uh, the, the illustration, like to practice our profession, and we really choose it. It's a way of life. Could you tell us about um, um, how was your first time in Mad Magazine? The first time I was published in Mad? Yes. Well, when I got to New York and I started bringing my portfolio around, because that's how you did it in those old days. You had a case with samples of your artwork. And okay. You went from place to place and hoped that some art director would be interested in your work. And of course, even then I had the same style that I, I have now, more or less. And people kept saying, you should go to MAD. You should go to MAD. You should go to MAD. So, I called up the art director at MAD, John Putnam, and he was very nice, but he said, we don't need you. <laughs> uh, he said, we really uh, are a closed shop right now. We have all the artists we need. And you got to remember, this was a time where they had Mort Drucker and Jack Davis and George Woodbridge and Al Jaffe and M Don Martin and... Uh, Sergio Aragones and, and Antonio Projias and uh, Jack Ricard and, and on and on. They really didn't need any young wannabes, but they were very nice. He said, come up and, and show us your stuff anyhow. Make a, you can pay us a social visit. <laughs> so I went up and Putnam looked at my work and Lenny Brenner, who was the production manager, and, and uh, Nick Meglin, one of the editors, they were very encouraging, but they said, you know, we really uh, don't have any openings right now. So for the next few years, this is 1976. So for the next few years, I started to getting other work. Uh, as you mentioned in the introduc introduction first, I got a job as a textile designer and I did that for a year. And I started to get freelance work, uh, Crazy Magazine, which was published by Marvel, other things. And then uh, in 1980, I got a phone call from Al Feldstein, the editor of MAD. 
Uh, do you want to translate that part now and I'll continue after? So it, this was December of 1980. I got a call from Al Feldstein. What I believe happened was that Norman Mingo, who had been doing all of the covers for MAD for 25 years, passed away. And uh, Jack Ricard had done some covers. I, think, I don't know if he had passed away yet, but uh, Al Feldstein knew he needed to start adding new artists. And uh, Nick Meglin remembered me from when I had come by a couple years earlier. And John Ficarra, who had just joined the MAD staff as an editor, also knew of my work from Scholastic magazines. They both suggested me to Feldstein. And the strange thing, I think, was that the first call was for a cover. Uh, I, there was no, like, trying out with a one page filler item. The first job I got from MAD was a cover. It was the cover of MAD number 223 that was dated June uh, 1981. And if you want, I'll show it to you. Yes. <laughs> Hold on, let me find it. Uh, here it is. You see it? Yes. Okay, so yes, that was the cover of MAD number 223 that actually hit the stands probably in uh, April. April. Of 1981. Uh, Feldstein actually sent me a little doodle, a little sketch that he had made, and he said that he wanted the hand to have six fingers. I thought that was the dopiest thing I had ever heard of, but I didn't know at that time uh, that it was a mad tradition. Okay. That, that, so I just went along with it and boy, did they get a lot of mail about the six fingered hand holding the gun. <laughs> it was, you know, I was 27 years old and I was still pretty early on in my career, basically two years into it. So uh, it was very exciting. Uh, and I was very nervous. In fact, I was so nervous that I did the entire piece of art twice up and I didn't like it. It, it just felt too like I had a gigantic head. So I did the whole thing over a second time. And that was the one that was used in the cover. Now, I, looking back, I don't know that one was better than the other or one was worse than the other, but uh, I was just nervous, you know. That, oh, okay. You know, this is my first mad job my first mad cover um now the thing is Now, the thing about that cover is that um, I'm not quite sure exactly what the reason is. My guess is that the issue didn't sell particularly well by the standards of 1981. Uh, but whatever the reason, I did not get another job from MAD until four years later when uh, Al Feldstein retired as editor and Nick Meglin and John Ficarra took over. So I 
My second mad job was four years later. Ah, ok. Estaba, cont que estaba contando que eh, esa revista en particular tuvo muy pocas ventas y el editor eh, en esa época pues no le dio más trabajo a Sam hasta que cuatro años después se retiró y digamos que el mando de Mad Magazine quedó en John Ficarra y Nick Meglin y a partir de ahí pues él empezó a trabajar fue a través uh, uh, 1985 1984 Uh, it was 1985. Sí, 1985. This, this was the piece. It was a movie parody of the movie Ghostbusters. Uh, and actually, it was a three movie parodies. Ghostbusters, Karate Kid, and Purple Rain. Each movie was drawn by a different artist. Uh, Karate Kid was drawn by Angelo Torres. Purple <laughs> Rain by Harry North. Uh, and I got to do Ghostbusters as well as the opening scene that showed the critics, Siskel and Ebert, Sist uh, Siskel and Ebert, about to go into the movie theater. So that was my second mad job. <laughs> so, uh, we can say that this, it was uh, really, um, you, you started to work, uh, to be a regular contributor, uh, with this uh, work? Well, I don't know if I was exactly a regular right regular. away. Um, I, I did get more work, um, but it, some of it was um, you know, two pagers and they weren't necessarily every issue. Uh, and, and I think a lot of it was in my own mind that I, the, the mad artists, the usual gang of idiots um, mm -hmm. had been a very stable group for a very long time at that point. And I really felt like the new guy. Usually the illustrators uh, like to practice our profession. Could you tell us about that transition between being a, a illustrator, freelance illustrator and art director, in this case in Mad Magazine? Okay, well, Now we're jumping ahead another 18 or 19, well, from 85, it would have been 14 years. Um, so I, I did become a regular. I was doing a lot of work for Matt. And in fact, as the years went on, I was doing more and more work for Matt, meaning less and less other work. I mean, I still had other magazines and some advertising. Uh, I was still doing work for Scholastic. Um, But uh, MAD became not only my major client, but it, it became what I was known for. Just as, you know, you knew the work of Mort Drucker because of MAD. You knew the work of Dave Berg because of MAD. Uh, I was starting to move into that. Um, but by the same token, at that point, 1990, the end of 1998, I had been doing illustration for over 20 years, about 22 years. And I was starting to feel what we might call a, a midlife crisis. I had been doing the same kind of work for a very long time. I was trying to figure out, was there something new that I could do? Was it, could I kind of modify my style? Could I uh, branch out somehow? One of the things I was uh, looking into at that time was just doing drawing with pencil as opposed to pen and ink and watercolor. It's just something because I thought pencil was more immediate. It was more spontaneous. Um, so I was actually at a kind of crisis point. I don't know if you want to interrupt at this point and, and translate or if you want me just to just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep okay. going. All right. So just as I had gotten that phone call from Al Feldstein um, 20 years earlier, um, I got a call from John Ficarra. Now, very often I used to hang around the mad offices. I'd deliver a job and, and sit around and, and chat with John and Nick. And I knew that they were looking for an art director. Now, it never, ever crossed my mind to, to throw my hat into that ring because to me, 
art directors were designers, not necessarily illustrators. Um, but I, I knew that they were looking and uh, we were talking about it. And a, a day after I had one of these chats with John, he called me up and said, how would you like to be the art director? I said, are you kidding? And I, I really, I was really taken by surprise because I didn't ever see myself as an art director. Uh, and I asked him, I said, do you really think I would be more valuable to MAD as an art director than I am as an illustrator? Because there'd be no way I could do both, at least not in any large way. I couldn't do six page movie parodies because it was just too time consuming. And he said, yes, I, I, I do think you'd be more valuable to us as the art director. Um, so, you know, I, I, I asked him to let me think about it. I talked it over with my wife. And there, there were some real definite reasons, even though I didn't see myself as an art director, as I mentioned before, I was at a kind of point where I needed to try something new. And this would be very new. I'd be totally out of my comfort zone. I'd be totally out of my wheelhouse. Um, however, I had a four-year-old at home. My daughter, Alicia, was four years old. And the idea of having regular hours, the idea of getting regular pay, of benefits, vacation, that all very much appealed to me as the father of a four-year-old. Uh, so you take that and you combine it with the fact that uh, I wanted to try something new. I said, okay, I'll try it. I'll give it a year. If I don't like it after a year, I'll go back to illustrating. I guess I must have liked it because I did it for 19 years before basically I was kicked out. Okay. I will try to, to put in a few words. In few words, I will. I, yes, I will do. I will do. Eh, yo, eh, le, le estaba preguntando un poco sobre cómo fue esa transición de ser un ilustrador freelance a ser eh, art, eh, director de arte. Porque, bueno, los ilustradores siempre queremos trabajar, ¿no? Queremos crear, queremos estar todo el tiempo en acción. Y cómo, cómo pasar de una cosa a la otra. En su caso, claro, él decía que, bueno, él está acostumbrado a ser freelance, quizá llega un momento en que se cansaba un poco de hacer siempre lo mismo, uh, no solo trabajando para Matt, sino para libros escolares y otro tipo de publicaciones, publicidad, este, hasta que le llegó la oferta, el de, de John Ficarra, que quiere ser director de arte, no, 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 lo, no lo asimilaba, porque él pensaba que bueno, ser director de arte es una cosa de diseñadores, no de ilustradores, ya le voy a hacer una pregunta sobre eso. Eh, y hasta que, pues, la situación personal, pues, tener una hija de cuatro años y, y decirse, bueno, mira, vamos a, esto es un trabajo que puede ser regular y la, el tema de la estabilidad, pues, jugó y, de, claro, decidió lanzarse a ser director de arte, pues, y aquí está, hasta que, bueno, se quedó 19 años hasta que literalmente, pues, lo echaron, así me lo dijo. Yes. Now, now I have to tell you yes. that at, at, at first, now I don't know if this uh, uh, simile will translate, uh, but John Ficarra said that in the beginning, I was like a deer in the headlights because I had no idea what I was doing. I've always said that I took this job with no training, no experience, and no qualifications whatsoever. But uh. they thought I could do it. And to a great extent, I relied on the people who were already there working in the, in the mad art department. Nadina Simon, uh, um, uh, uh, Marla Weich, um, um, Tom Naskowski. They had been there a fairly long time and knew what they were doing. So they helped me learn my job, as did Lenny Brenner, who had been the art director for many years and had been sort of retired a few years before, but was still working as a consultant. So I learned on the job. Um, and and it, was, it was a very interesting first few years. I will, um, just before translate that, 
I will add something about when okay. you say when you say that uh, uh, when they John asked you to, to be art director the first time, you say no. Mm -hmm. You thought that it was uh, uh, designer stuff, something for designer. And let me see. And I, there's something that I I have told you in private, in private, and I and I and I, and I tell you in public the same thing. Because I learned a lot with you, working with you. Well, thank no, you. because every critic, every revision, every line was justified. Why? You, you, because you are also an illustrator, an illustrator, and you know what it means. Yeah. And that's it's very important. And um, even if you you have some troubles trying to learn the, the, to, to be an art director at the beginning and you have a, 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 some people who help you to improve and, and you know, uh, it's, it's the process, it's, 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 it's like that. Well, I did realize that that was my one strength, that uh, ha having had a long career as an illustrator, I knew what made a good picture and um, when I, when I spoke with artists like yourself, I'm, I'm sure Leo, you have had the same experience I have had many times that you get a call often from editors rather than art directors. And what they want is nearly impossible. You know, I want a big scene with lots of people and on their belt buckle is, uh, an inscription to my loving husband. <laughs> they can't do that. I knew that if an artist ever said to me, that's impossible, it can't be done, I could show them how to do it. That I would never give somebody an assignment that I could not at least help them figure out. And uh, so my weakness as an art director was, I, 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 and to this day, I'm not a great designer. I'm an okay designer. Okay. So I always said my strongest um, success as an art director was hiring people who were better than I was to work in the art department. I hired uh, people who could design rings around me like Ryan Flanders and Patty Dwyer and Doug Thompson. And I always felt that the important thing was to let everyone know that their skills were respected by me um, so that I would never take credit for something that someone who worked for me did. I, I knew a lot of people in other parts of the company where I worked who felt that it was only good if they took credit for all the good stuff and took none of the blame for the bad <laughs> stuff. And I felt that, you know, if, if Ryan Flanders designed something, I wanted everybody to know that he designed it because I thought it made me look better because I hired him. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, you know, just as you say, you learned from me, I learned so much from, from the younger people who were better than I was at those particular things. Uh, and I think it made me a better designer and it made me a better art director too. Okay, I will try to... Ok, ok. Eh, él estaba, digamos, añadiendo un punto a lo que estaba hablando de cuando él entró a, a hacer la dirección de arte en Mad Magazine. Que John le decía que él era... No recuerdo cuál era la expresión, pero bueno, que fue un poco complicado porque él, él, él no tenía mucha experiencia como diseñador, eh, buen ilustrador, como, pero tenía algunas digamos, algunas deficiencias y se rodeó de gente que lo ayudaba y fue aprendiendo en el camino. Y bueno, yo, yo le quise añadir un punto y una cosa que yo se lo he dicho en privado y se la digo en público ahora, que yo con él aprendí muchísimo, porque cada crítica, cada observación que él me hacía era una cosa que estaba justificada y eso un director de arte es importantísimo. Eso no... El hecho de que sea ilustrador, él comprende lo que, o sea, cuando él pide algo a un, a un subalterno eh, como director de arte, no le va a pedir algo que él no pueda hacer, ¿sabes? Y eso es lo importante en, en, en este caso, y por eso que 
Bueno, ya eso lo he dicho, así que... I could have said it better myself. <laughs> After 30, uh, how, how long have you been working for Mad Magazine? Ah, uh, well, a... I was a freelancer for 18 years. 18? And then I was the art director for 19 years. So um, well, 36. then I've been freelancing for the last two and a half years. Okay. So basically okay. It's, it, it'll be 40 years in December. Okay. And how, um, from when Matt moved to Burbank uh, with a new staff, uh, but uh, the rest of the gang stayed in New York, how, how do you keep the, the, the the momentum going after that. I don't know what to say. How 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 was going at this moment to when you realized that was was over for New York for Matt in New York? Are you talking about that that last year that we put out the yes. magazine? Well, okay. So we we learned in February of 2017 that Mad would be moving to California, um, and as had happened a few years before when they first brought up the idea um and when they i mean uh, the people at dc comics which publishes mad uh, nobody in new york staff had any interest in moving to california you know we're all we all have commitments here families here and um so that is what happened when uh they told us in february of 2017 they realized that none of us would move Uh, except for one person, a young fellow we had just hired named Bern Mendoza. I know him. You know Bern, yeah. He's 20, at that time, he was 26 years old. He, and we all said, this is what you should be doing. Go, have an adventure, go to California. Uh, but the rest of us, our lives were too tied up in New York. Uh, so we had, we knew that we had till the end of the year. And it was about four or five more issues that we had to put out. Well, two things. One, it's our job. You have to do it. The second was, I hate to say this, I think we had an attitude of, we'll show them. We'll put out the best magazine anyone ever saw so that when they do move, they're going to be sorry. I mean, and, and especially in that last issue, you were part of it, I think, Leo, in our very final issue. Didn't you do something for us in that one? In 2017? It would have been issue 550. We tried no. to cram everybody we had ever worked with in that last issue. Um, oh, I wasn't. The last uh, with, the, with your team was uh, a double page, I think. Uh, I still remember. Oh, the wedding one? The wedding one, I think. No, it was the wedding. No, it was uh, the. I, I, I remember the, the sympathy cards. Sympathy. Which one? Sympathy cards. Sympathy cards. Okay, Sympathy yeah, cards. yeah, I remember that one. Yes. Yeah, you did some, and I think Emily Flake did some, and somebody else. There were three of you in that same job, right? Yes, yes. Uh, from Europe, uh, <laughs> Alex is uh, showing the... No, but uh, this is the Alex, my friend, my colleague, is showing the last issue, but it's uh, the no, 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 no. team. I, I am in, a, I am in, in that issue. Uh, yes, just, is, uh, right, just uh, with me in the other page, in the next page. Oh, you're in that issue too? Yes, the, the Trum Bestiary. The great But, Trum Bestiary. There, well, there's mine, yeah. Yes. Well, here, uh, so people get a better sight of that one. I'll, I'll pull it up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hold on. Uh, oh, let me, let me, I will put uh, a little bit in the uh, uh, spotlight. That's the one that uh, you were showing, I think. Yeah, this was, this, when I got this job, uh, you know, I got a call first from the new editor, Bill Morrison, and then after he left, the art director, Susie Hutchinson. Yes. And they said, you want to do a TV parody? This is a TV show on Amazon called The, the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I said, I don't know. I have not done something like this in over 20 years. Uh, it'd been over 20 years since I'd done a movie parody or a TV parody. And they're a lot of work. This yes. turned out to be five pages. And I took it because I needed to prove to myself I could still do it. 
Um, and I, you know, I'm happy with how it came out. I mean, just the fact I was able to do it at all made me happy. Um, but um, anyhow, uh, uh, the last issue of Mad that we put out, which was number 550, they started renumbering after they went to California. Yes. Um, actually, I have the cover of that one I can show you. Hold on. Yeah. See, I came prepared. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Here it is. That's a cover. Yes. By Mark Fredrickson. Yes. And it, we kind of, we did that deliberately. We wanted to show that we, we, we had a little bit of spunk left in us. And, <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, to be very honest, we all, we all, we all were sorry to say goodbye. You know, I had been working on Mad at for 19 years. Uh, Joe Rayola and Charlie Kadu had been editors for 33 years. John Ficara had been on the Mad staff for 37 years. That's a long time. And uh, even the younger people like Ryan Flanders and Dave Croato and Patty Dwyer and, and, and uh, Jacob Lambert, uh, in some cases they had been around for 10, 15, 17 years. So uh, uh, it, it, we were a family. And it was hard to say goodbye, and and uh, I think, you know, I, I think it's been now two and a half years, and you move on one way or another. I've 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 gone on to do some more illustration for mm -hmm. Matt for for other clients, um, and I, you know, my heart is really with drawing, and even in the 19 years I had that job, I always felt like I was an illustrator who had a job as an art director. Uh, but uh, I do miss it. I miss hanging around the office with the guys. And although we wouldn't be hanging around the office now, anyhow. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, you know, we had a lot of fun. And we also, you know, every now and then, somebody would come by and visit the office. Uh, like one of the last people to visit us that who was famous, uh, and I don't know if everybody outside of the States knows him, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who wrote the Broadway musical and starred in it, uh, Hamilton. Uh, he came mm -hmm. by and it was, it was very thrilling to have him visit. So, you know, definitely mixed emotions. Yes. Yes. Translate yes. that if you can. <laughs> Ok, no, pero yo le estaba preguntando si, bueno, cambié un poco la reacción de la pregunta. ¿Cómo, cómo fue ese momento de, de, bueno, cuando se enteraron de que Matt ya no, que ya la iban a mudar para, para Burbank, para California? Y que obviamente eh, ya las personas que ya estaban más asentadas en Nueva York no se iban a mudar para California porque era, era cambiar todo, ¿no? Solamente el más joven de los de los de los de los que estaban ahí el apellido Mendoza se fue para para Burban de hecho yo trabajé con él en la última revista y, y bueno si, si, siempre es algo de, de emociones encontradas no eh, porque siempre claro tantos años pues siempre se extraña ha seguido trabajando haciendo sus cosas tra ilustrando pero pero es eso, ha sido parte de, una parte importante de su vida y todos los compañeros que han trabajado con él, eh, digamos las últimas visitas a la oficina. Y yo sí, yo, eso se siente, porque si ven su página de Facebook, ven es, es la foto con el grupo de, 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 de ex compañeros, ¿no? Y, y eso está siempre ahí. Así que, bueno, I, I was telling them, I was telling them that uh, I had just a, a little part of this, and it's, uh, In your Facebook, you have uh, a photo of you, um, the people who worked with you in Mad Magazine. So this is something more than an office. It's uh, uh, people who share a lot with you. It had to be special for you. So yeah, well, that's very true because there was a long history to Matt. As you mentioned, Matt was in New York for 65 years, and Um, one of the things that I, I, I had great respect for 
when I started as art director was that we still had eight or 10 people who had been working for MAD as writers, illustrators, cartoonists for over 50 years. Uh, Mort Drucker, Arnie Kogan, um, um, of course, Al Jaffe, Dick DiBartolo, um, um, gosh, Sergio Aragones. These are people who had worked continuously for the same magazine for over half a century. And, and so there definitely was a feeling of being a family. And that all stemmed from the founding publisher, Bill Gaines. Uh, he created an atmosphere that people felt like they were a family um, with him as kind of the, the father figure at the top. Uh, and that really was solidified when he started taking everybody on trips beginning in 1959. Um, for a few years, it was to places in the Caribbean like Haiti and Puerto Rico, and then they expanded on from that. Um, so I didn't feel like I was really part of the usual gang of idiots until I got invited to my first trip in 1987, where we went to Switzerland and then Paris. And I was worried because I was still a young kid. I was 32, 34. And these guys had all been working for MAD forever, and I was still a new, new kid. Uh, but they all treated me like I was one of them. Uh, they treated me like I was one of their own. And uh, that's when I really felt like I belonged. Ok, eh, yo, yo le estaba comentando lo, lo, lo que le decía a ustedes sobre la foto con los ex compañeros de trabajo y él comentaba que bueno, un poco el espíritu de Bill Gates, del fundador, era ese espíritu de grupo, de familia y él lo, digamos, él como era de los más jóvenes que entró a mediados de los 80, eh, a finales del 87 fue que porque hacían viajes, Bill Gates organizaba viajes a, a Europa, a varias partes del mundo y... Y, y en uno de esos viajes, el, el primer viaje que él hizo fue en el 87, y eso, digamos, a partir de ahí lo integró más en el grupo. So, I, I think I translated. I hope so. <laughs> so, oh, wait, wait. I'll give a 20 minute answer, and then you'll say, he says he's okay. <laughs> yes, well, uh, too much uh, talking, and so I think it's time to work. Have you prepared your pencil, your paper, or your canvas, oil, or? Yeah, right, I'm gonna do oil painting. Normally, I, I prefer to draw with a number two pencil. Okay. Paper. That's my, but I don't have a, a, a rig like, like Leonardo does, where I have, a, I can put my camera above and watch <laughs> me. So I'm gonna do it on, on the computer. Okay. I have a Cintiq, and I'm gonna switch to that. And I was trying to decide who I would draw because, okay. uh, you know, it's a demonstration. And I thought I wanted to make sure since it's an international audience that I drew someone who might be known internationally. And I finally decided, <laughs> Vanessa wants me to draw her. Uh, <laughs> I, I got this all prepared, Vanessa. So I'm going to uh, switch to my, my uh, computer screen, if I can find it. There it is. Uh, so you can all okay. see I decided okay. I would try my hand at Meghan Markle, who uh, was married to one of the princes of England, although they decided to stop being princes and, and move to America. Uh, I just find her an interesting looking person. You know, she was an Amer American actress who somehow stole the heart of the British princess um, and then moved into moved to England with them, and I think decided she didn't like it there. Um, uh, so, as you see, I, I assembled a bunch of different photos. I actually had pulled about 30, but I couldn't fit 30 on my screen here. Uh, even when I draw with a pencil, in the old days, I would take, I would have photos torn out of magazines, and, and I'd hold them under my left hand as I was trying to draw with my right. This at least leaves my hands free. So, um, my my belief about caricature is that you, you don't simply exaggerate in any individual feature. I have you know, a big nose, uh, big ears, whatever. Okay. What you're trying to exaggerate is the person. Uh, the word caricature comes from an Italian word that means to load. 
Uh, so it's a loaded portrait. And the question is always, what do you load it with? Um, editorial cartoonists whom I know, people like Steve Brodner, Ann Telnes, uh, Michael Ramirez, they can be very, very vicious because there's a lot of anger in, in what they, they do when they're commenting on political uh, things. Um, other caricaturists can load with love. Um, I always felt that Al Hirschfeld, uh, when he drew a caricature of a, of a Broadway actor or actress, it was filled with love for Broadway, for the theater, and for the actors and actresses he drew. I think Mort Dr Drucker had a lot of love for the actors and actresses he drew when he did movie uh, portraits. So, you know, I think I follow a little bit in, in Mort's uh, uh, steps. Now, so I, I try to get a sense of the general shape of the head. Um, and, and I don't really uh, worry too much about um, the specifics yet. I'm trying to get uh, where the features are, how they're located. Uh, okay. Mort Drucker always said that it's not the, the size of the features that are important, it's the space between them. I'm not quite sure I know exactly what he meant by that, but it, it sounds good. Um, so, you know, I, I just generally get general shapes in, kind of get the feel for what. Let, let me translate that. Let me translate that. Uh, just uh, okay. For well, a... you, you talk while I draw. Okay. Um, it was a very interesting quote. Uh, 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 perdón. Una 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 unas palabras interesantes de Mark Rocker que decía en el tema de la caricatura que no es importante es el, el tema del tamaño sino la distancia entre los elementos a la cara o sea, como para ponerse a pensar no esa es la, la traducción literal okay, I'm going to actually make this a little smaller um, yeah. hold on a second uh, What a pleasure to watch Sam draw again, Mike Lowe. Mike uh, Lowe? Yes. Sean Leo. Mike. Mike worked for us at MAD for, I don't know, how long did Mike work there? It, it felt like too short a time before he moved to, uh, uh, to Seattle. Ah, okay. Omar Ceballos is asking uh, how editor decide the 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 ideas or for the the cover uh oh boy <laughs> i will tell you that the least favorite part of my job at mad aside from any of the bureaucratic stuff the business stuff was cover meetings because covers are the hardest part of the magazine to come up with and uh you know every now and then somebody would have a wonderful idea and and it would be decided right away but more often than not there would be meetings and meetings and meetings that would go on for hours and then days and um uh i i usually tried to stay away from all those meetings you know saying well i got work to do um so uh i would get called in when they needed a sketch done. So somebody would have an idea and maybe uh, somebody, usually John Ficarra would do some kind of little doodle about it. And then I would try to make it a little bit more finished with a drawing. And if they, if they thought it had some potential, I might even then go into my office and I would do a kind of collage uh, with different photographs and things in order to, to make it really look like what the cover might look like. 
but I would tell you for on the average for every cover that we did we might have anywhere from 30 to 50 different ideas that we were trying to figure out what worked what didn't um, it really was was kind of a, a nightmare okay okay I, I will translate pesadilla it, it means nightmare <laughs> okay right, yeah. eh, me, me, me estaban preguntando eh, Omar Ceballos de Perú que, que cómo era la, digamos la, 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 cómo se decidía el hacer una portada y, Mar, y Sam dice que, bueno, era, bueno, de, complicadísimo. Mucha gente, digamos, a decirlo en palabras, uh, mucha gente metiendo la mano en la sopa. Y, y era bien complicado y en sus palabras, pues, una pesadilla. Una pesadilla es lo que podemos resumir. Ok, it's done. I will try to read another one. Um, um, Okay, uh, uh, Alex, my colleague Alex Gallego is uh, is making a question. Okay, I have uh, Alex Gallego. It's uh, without here hearing in Zoom. I have a question. When uh, when you are when you were art director, how did you shoot new artists? What what, what what was the most distinct ability you were looking for? Well, first of all, you have to understand that we already had lots and lots of artists working for us by the time I came in. And, um, you know, in some cases, those artists were also writers. And so they basically wrote and drew their own stuff, like Sergio Argonis and uh, uh, Al Jaffe, um, John Caldwell. But if we had an art, art article, um, the first question would always be, Uh, who's best for this? And we would have preference for the people who, you know, had some uh, history with Matt. You know, I, I always wanted to bring in new artists, but I also wanted to respect the people who, who had already been with us for a long time. Okay. Um, so uh, the first question is, who's the best for this job? In some cases, the, that would be a very easy choice. You know, if you're going to do a movie parody, it's going to be Mort Drucker or Tom Richmond. Um, you know, there are a few other people who could do that. We would choose amongst them. Um, every now and then, I'd say, you know, we got to try somebody new. Sometimes it would be somebody I already knew. Somebody, sometimes it was just somebody I had work that they'd sent in. That's how I first came to you, Leo. Was you? I remember you sent me uh, a CD-ROM with yes, see the ROM. <laughs> samples of your work, and that sat on my desk for years before I even called you. One uh, year, I think one year, something like that. Well, maybe only a year. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, all, we always did want to give preference to people we had worked with before. Um, but but the first job was always crucial because the question is. Could we work with them? And, and there's a lot of aspects to that. One is uh, a personal aspect, you know, how, long, how well do you get together? How, how well do you get along talking on a telephone? Um, some of it was, does the style work? But more importantly was, do they understand what we're trying to do? Um, and that's, that's hard to put your finger on. It, 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 it's not just do they have a sense of humor, but do they understand the point we're trying to make? Do they understand uh, the reason why we wanted their work? Here's a good, one of the artists we used a lot was Mark Stutzman. Now Mark is a poster artist and he's okay. a wonderful, okay. wonderful artist, but I think he himself would say that he was not a cartoonist. That the work he did was not in and of itself funny. But one of the reasons we wanted to use Mark was because the work he did would be used in a kind of ironic way. So that the very fact that in and of itself it wasn't funny was funny. I, I don't know, uh, you're gonna have a hell of a time trying to translate that, Leo. Um, but he understood that that's why we were using him. And he lent his talents to 
that end. Every now and then, you know, I'd come, I'd come on someone whose work I liked. I'd ask them to do a job and it wasn't working out. Their sketches weren't strong. I did, I do as I did with you. I'd make suggestions. I'd even like do little doodles to show them what I wanted. And at the end, what they did just didn't quite gel. Sometimes I'd give them a second chance. I'd give them another assignment. Um, because everyone is nervous their first mad job. Um, some people would, would do fine on their second job, others wouldn't. And that's how you kind of learned. Are they, are they part of the usual gang of idiots? Do they fit in with us? But it, it was not, it's not rocket science. Sometimes it's just gut, a gut decision. Okay. Um, okay. You talk while I do something else. Okay, I, I, will, I will try, I will try. Whoa, so, whoa, 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 oh, okay. Okay, this is the queen, the service, uh, secret service of the queen. Is trying to kill her <laughs> stepdaughter. Uh, wait a second, no, no. Step <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, eh, eh, estaba, eh, estaba respondiendo una pregunta de Leonardo Nieves, de aquí en el Facebook, que, ah no, Leonardo Nieves no, perdón, ya leo, ya leo tu pregunta, es sobre cómo, eh, cómo escogía la pregunta de, de, de Alex, cómo escogía, cuál era el, el, el criterio para escoger lo, los artistas, los ilustradores, y claro, primero es difícil porque, por un lado, Matt eh, conservaba, digamos, los lo, lo veteranos, los viejos como marca de la revista, ¿no? Como, lo, como lo, lo, los baluartes, ¿no? La, la primera línea. Y los nuevos ilustradores es complicado, porque hay tanta gente. Y, y no siempre es fácil, porque ¿cómo, ¿cómo saldrá el primer trabajo? O sea, ¿cómo saldrá el segundo? ¿Cuál va a ser? Eh, es siempre complicado y... Daba algunos ejemplos de, depende, depende cómo, cómo, cuál sea la comunicación entre, entre el director de arte y, y los ilustradores, en algún, por supuesto, como todo, en algunos casos mejor que otros. Eh, tuve que hacerlo muy resumido. <laughs> ok. There's okay, a little a... thing here, but ok, this, this works, I, I think. Uh, are we done or should I keep drawing? I don't know. You keep drawing. Keep drawing. Okay. Because I thought I'd, I'd draw uh, Harry, her husband, too. Of course. Okay. There's some uh, questions here, or there's a lot of questions. <sighs> Let me see. Let me see. Uh, Leonardo Nieves uh, um, is a colleague from Venezuela, was asking... Uh, Ah, okay, okay. Um, uh, my colleague was asking, does, ha does Sam have a book published with his work outside math? No. 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 That's uh, translated. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm translating that. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. Uh, Roberto Echeto is a, 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 is a designer and a writer also. Uh, Mr. Sam, how do you see the sense of humor in this moment? Is it uh, free as usual or have you noticed some changes in terms of hostility toward humorists and humoristes? I, I'm going to assume that, that he's asking in the context of what's been going on the last several months, first with the coronavirus, and then here in the States with, with the violence that has come out of the protests over the killing of George Floyd. Um, if, if that is indeed the case, um, I will say this. Uh, it is indeed difficult to maintain a sense of humor when, when horrible things happen. And yet, I think that there are people who don't have a choice, that in a sense, it's, it's kind of in our genes, in our bones, in our blood, to see 
uh, the humorous side of things, even if it can be a darkly humorous thing. Okay. I mean, there have been many events during my lifetime when people said, oh, that's the end of humor. It's the end of irony. Um, it really happened a lot 20 years, almost 20 years ago in 2001 when the World Trade Centers were attacked and fell. Uh, it, was, it was a traumatic period for uh, Americans in general, I think maybe people around the world in general, but definitely for people in New York. And um, I think that for a while, everybody who was involved with humor wondered, are we going to be able to do what we do anymore? Will, will, do, are people going to not find anything funny? Well, you know, I, I think that we very quickly uh, got off this. Now, we had to actually change the cover of, of the next issue we had. It had already been uh, published, and it was a cover that was goofing on the New York City Marathon. It was by John Caldwell, and he showed Alfred breaking away from the pack of runners in New York City and crossing what he thought was the finish line and it was actually a police line, and the police were there with a dead body. Oh. We thought that given what had happened to the World Trade Center, it was not a good idea to run that cover. Okay. So we did actually, uh, and we, it cost us a lot of money because the issue was already printed, that we did a new cover that kind of reflected what had happened. It was a big, um, and I don't have it able to show you, but it was a big, uh, blow up of just Alfred's mouth and where the gap in his teeth was, we put a little American flag. Okay. Uh, but that was sort of it. We weren't going to dwell on that. I think two issues later, uh, we had an article uh, how, how uh, the attack on the World Trade Center changed everything. And it was a humorous article. It was a funny article. And we felt that if you couldn't find the humorous side of things, what's the point? And we continued on. And the fact that we, that in New York, we continued on for another 16 years and they've continued on in California for two and a half years since then helps make my point. Okay, let, let me see. I have a question uh, uh, from Jason Saylor. Oh, hi, Jason. I've always noticed with Sam style that uh, he usually always had a lot of exaggeration with the jaw, how he draws jaws. It's a signature San Viviano style. I was wondering when the first started to do that. Same with, the, with how he draw eyes, very unique style. You can look one of these caricatures and know right away that it's Sam Viviano because of the eyes and the jaw style. All while it's still capturing the likeness of uh, John Man. Oh no, that, 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 that's another question. Yeah, I was going to say, is there a question there? Uh, this is a comment. What's a comment? <laughs> <laughs> More no, than a question. That, that, you can tell my caricatures by the eyes, is that correct? Yeah, it was wondering when he first started doing that. 
Well, you know, um, pretty early on, um, I, I started drawing funny pictures of people when I was maybe even in, in middle school, but definitely high school. And, um, you know, it was just drawing funny pictures of the teachers I had. And uh, I think that by the time I got into college, I really knew that that's what I liked doing. So that when, now when I, when I moved to New York, I thought that I needed to be really well-rounded as an illustrator. So my first portfolio had like everything I'd ever done in college. And art directors would look at all this different stuff because it had serious portraits and it had oil paintings and it had etchings and you, you name it. And they'd look at me and say, but what do you do? And I realized that at least in those days, I think things have changed now, but in those days, because there was so many, so many people who had specialties that if you didn't specialize, you'd be lost in the crowd. So I, I went home and I said, okay, I got to figure out what I do best, what I enjoy doing most, and uh, what I think I could make a living at doing. And um, to me, the answer was pretty obvious. It was caricature. So I then put together a portfolio of nothing but caricature. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, show you, I'm going to find the earliest piece that I was, I was going to share with you here. Okay. And I think it goes back to one of my first professional jobs. Hold on, it's gonna take me a moment to find it. Uh, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I, I started getting work in 1978 with Scholastic magazines. And one of the first was this one for Dynamite Magazine, the okay. Beatles versus the v Bee Gees. Um, and while, you know, I hope that I have matured a bit in 42 years, that I think you can still see the same earmarks that I think Jason Seiler was talking about, uh, whether it was the eyes. A lot of people always point to my jaws. The, the jowl lines are always kind of exploded. I even did that with, with uh, Meghan Markle in my drawing there. I'll show you one other one I did. I, hopefully you all know that's the Beatles versus the Bee Gees. Um, <laughs> I, I noticed, I noticed. One other one from around the same period. Um, here's another Scholastic magazine, Bananas. And uh. five comedians who were on the upcoming there, I think, I, I actually can't see it right now. So. It's uh, Robin Williams as Mark, and there's John Belushi from Animal House, and Steve Martin, I think, and Billy Crystal, and, and Andy, Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman, right. yes. So now this, uh, this is pretty early on, and I think that the way I worked was already pretty well established. Um, you know, I don't. It would take someone else to say, well you know, you're, you're still kind of immature in what you're doing. Uh, but I look at it and I say, okay, well, I think it's still pretty much what I'm doing now. But thank you for that question, Jason. And thank you for uh, the compliments. You know, it's, it's very, it's very complicated. Jason is, to... by the way, a terrific, uh, an amazing painter uh, yeah. and a terrific caricaturist himself. You are the number 11 the interview number 11. I know at first I told you that you are the, 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 the number 10, but I, I was wrong. You are the I number... Number 13. That's <laughs> my lucky number. I, I've seen in some of your other interviews, <coughs> people who aren't using the computer like me hold up their artwork. Okay. Uh, well, okay. So this, this is actually the last finished piece I did. Okay. And it's the cover of the current issue of MAD. Um, <laughs> the new issue of MAD is a special um, tribute to Al Jaffe. Al Jaffe is 99 years old. He's worked not only for MAD longer than anyone else on earth, but he's actually a couple, a few years ago, got the Guinness Book of World Records as the cartoonist with the longest career ever. 
and this is a special tribute to him and um, they fished out an old cover idea that he had given to Mad a long time ago they never ran and Susie Hutchinson the art director asked him who he would like to see illustrate it and he was kind enough to suggest me so uh, the new issue of Mad, the all Jaffe issue, um, has a cover that's actually a, like a collaboration between Al and myself. It was his idea, but I did the finished art. So here it is. Ah, wow. Now, now the actual finished art has some, uh, on the cover has some changes, um, which, uh, I, I can show you, hold on. That's the way the cover actually looks. I don't know if you can see me in the small, so. I have seen, I, I have seen this cover uh, by, in the, in the it, on internet. all over Facebook. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Susie wanted that to be an x-ray, so it, I had to, I used digital means to invert the image. And then I also put a little pattern on Alfred's, <laughs> uh, uh, hospital gown so but of course nowadays does anyone use finished art everything is is digitally fixed up mm, question for tom man tom oh, man tom, tom man. man i went to high school with yes right <laughs> in the in the early in the in the late 60s and early the late 70s. 60s oh i've known tom for 56 years how have you adjusted your retirement getting better or has a quarantine made it more difficult? Is this Tom's question? Yes. Um, well, I'm retired in one sense in that I no longer have the job at MAD. And I had a long time, so I really do feel retired from that. Okay. But um, it gave me an opportunity to get back to drawing. And you know, I've had a few jobs from MAD. I've had a few other, I've been working desperately on a big, big, big job that I got early this year and I was supposed to have it done in March and because of the virus, it got postponed. So I'm working on that right now to finish it. Um, and I've done a few other things as well. Um, the, the, the first thing I did when I was retired was I decided that it was time to reconnect with a number of not only other people in the field, other illustrators, but also art directors I had worked with 20 years earlier, with editors I had worked with. And I started calling them up saying, let's have lunch. So at first my new career was having lunch. And uh, it, it sounds like a joke, but it actually was quite beneficial because it gave me the opportunity to see what the industry was like nowadays, which is not the same as it what I had left 20 years earlier. Um, and it reconnected me with a lot of friends uh, and with people in the, in the business. Then when the work started coming in, I had to kind of uh, curtail that a bit. Um, I do know I'm, I, I, I'm not as fast <clears throat> now as I used to be. Uh, I could turn over a job overnight if I needed to back in the old days. No, I can't. If only because I have to walk my dog sometimes. My dog is actually, where is he? Oh, he's over here. He was sitting under my desk. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, I, and I know he's really unhappy that I haven't walked him yet this afternoon. Uh. But I think all in all, I'm, I've, I've come to terms with it. I'm reasonably happy with it. Uh, and of course, it helps that I have a wife, a wife who's still working. My wife is a pediatrician. And uh, uh, so at least somebody is earning some real money right now. At this time, doesn't matter how, how much we had planned for the, this year, we are all living in this sci-fi movie. Yeah. Something like COVID-19, long, bigger, longest, and cut. <laughs> you know, something crazy that, uh, that changed everything. In three months, 
But you know, when people ask me how, how the virus has affected me, I say not really all that much because um, before it happened, I was mostly just doing things at home and now I'm still doing things at home. Uh, fortunately, before it hit, I had moved my studio into what used to be my daughter's bedroom. So that's where I work now. Um, you know, there have been some things like my old studio, which is a studio apartment in Greenwich Village in Manhattan. The idea was to renovate it so my daughter could move in. Well, the renovation hasn't happened yet. She had to find another apartment. So when it's renovated, I may actually sell the apartment. Okay, that's postponed things, but my day-to-day -day life is not all that much different. Um, in that respect, I'm actually very lucky, and a lot of it is because I'm retired. Uh, okay. I think in some ways, retirees in general are finding that their life has not been affected. A lot of people are worried about the virus. I actually got over that quickly because I caught it really early on, like two, three months ago. And I had a very mild case and it passed very quickly. So I was very lucky. Uh, yes. And since then, you know, uh, I've continued drawing, I've continued, uh, you know, the one thing I miss is, is hanging out with my other friends. Okay. You know, let's go to a bar and have a drink. Can't do that. Oh, well. we'll okay. I will I I I, uh, I I will try to translate the longest part. <laughs> okay, no, it's okay, it's okay. The short answer is I'm dealing with it well. Yes. Bueno, él pues está, le estaba preguntando un colega de él que de que estudió con él en en, en, en Detroit, un compañero de casi infancia, adolescencia que le preguntaba cómo llegaba el, te, el tema de, 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 de estar retirado, ¿no? Y con todo este asunto del, del coronavirus y, y la cuarentena. Y dice que, bueno, el, ya, ya eso, para un ilustrador, estar en cuarentena es un poco... Hay pocas cosas que cambian, ¿no? En cierto sentido, porque uno vive dentro de, 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 de esta cueva, como estoy yo aquí, como está Alex, como estamos... Y, y una cosa que había cambiado antes del coronavirus para él era que él tenía más tiempo cuando se retiró de Mark Magazine de, de compartir con los colegas, con los amigos, de hacer almuerzo. Y decía, bueno, es tiempo de almuerzo, de reunirse, de conocer, de, de, ¿sabes? de compartir. Y claro, una vez que todo esto llegó, pues la cosa se complicó. Yo, yo aproveché y le pregunté cómo salió el tema del COVID-19 y le comenté un poco cómo, cómo lo llevábamos, ¿no? Porque todos estamos en el, en, en el mismo barco. Y, y es eso, pues la vida nos cambió y, y nada. Seguimos adelante. And of course, the best thing about the lockdown, the quarantine, is it's giving me finally an opportunity to see just how long my beard can get and how bushy my hair can get. Exacto. Lo mejor que él lleva de la cuarentena es lo, 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 la, lo largo y que puede tener, lo, ver lo largo que puede eh, tener la barba y el cabello con esta nueva. You look like Moses. When, I hope we, we you, you will open the Hudson River. <laughs> the Hudson River. Across to New Jersey. Yeah, across to New Jersey. Well, I'll give a quick answer. Yes, no, uh, 1938, 1942, uh, kumquats, and my wife. Okay. Uh, Dolores Shermetaro. Thanks oh, for Dolores. Hi. Dolores. She's <laughs> thanks, my cousin Sam's wife. Thanks for the great interview, uh, Sammy. Looking good. Love, cousin, big Sammy and Dolores from Detroit. Love, love, love to both of you and, and the family. <laughs> so, Brian Durniak, Sam, one hey, beer Brian. only. Sam, one Brian beer. worked for me at MAD too. Yes. Another terrific designer. Yes, I know Brian. I, I, I've made a, a job for his wife in um, the book with um, Simon Schuster. Oh, okay. Uh, it was uh, homemade. Uh, 
home field advantage. It's a Justin Tuck book. In, the, in that time, he played in New York. Uh, Vivek Tagar from India. Wow. Who is, who is your favorite artist? It's a very complicated. <laughs> you could break it down in, in many ways, but if, if I had to pick one person in the entire history of art, I'd probably go with Rembrandt. Um, you know, I mean, I have great deal of love for all of the illustrators and cartoonists I've worked with, um, and and all of the illustration I grew up with reading magazines. But I think the, the one person I always come back to, and it just kind of takes my breath away, is is, is Rembrandt. It I understand your point. I understand your point. But uh, once uh, an Argentinian colleague, uh, Caleb Maxi Maximiliano Agnasco, is a very good uh, muralist. 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 Yes. And he asked me the same question. And I I went back to the the, the classics. For me, Leonardo da Vinci, not for the name. Uh, you know, it's like for doing a lot of things. It's yeah. not, and that uh, in, in, the, in the Renaissance, uh, it was like usually the artists and, and, and the people know a lot of disciplines. But Leonardo da Vinci, and especially once I saw his drawings in uh, Louvre, Le Musée du Louvre uh, in Paris, it was amazing, this, the, the work of uh, tissues of... Uh, Clothes, the, the 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 way he draw the. That's, that's the thing about Leonardo da Vinci, not necessarily Vinci. Leonardo Rodriguez, <laughs> is that he did so many things. Yes. Uh, uh, when he, I think he was uh, wanting to provide his services to the Duke of Milan, and he wrote a letter. It's yes, a very yes. long letter outlining his achievements in architecture, in engineering, in designing. Uh, Uh, weapons of war uh, and and all these other and at the bottom of this long letter it's like oh and I can paint too um, okay. I mean I like Michelangelo as an artist more than I do Leonardo there are certain paintings by Raphael or by uh, Botticelli if we're you know we're staying in the Renaissance that that I find more appealing um, even Leonardo's most famous painting the Mona Lisa Eh, I, I like uh, La Farn Farn Arena better. Uh, so, you know, uh, I mean, I, you're welcome to them by, by all means, but uh, I would pick somebody else personally. Okay. Le okay. Michelangelo is a great influence on me. Uh, John Singer Sargent, Carmine Infantino, the comic book artist, Joe Bowler, who did illustration oh. in magazines when I was a kid. Um, Al Hirschfeld, uh, there's so many, of course, Mark Drucker and Jack Davis. Um, but it's, but it's, too, it's too much, uh, you know, it's, too, it's hard to choose one. I, I must say, if, if you wanted to say who is the most influential artist, I'd probably have to say my dad. My oh, dad yeah. was not a professional. Uh, you know, he grew up in the Depression uh, and There was a lot of pressure from his family to get real work. Okay. You know, stop drawing those monkeys, get a job. And yet, when I was a kid growing up, even though he always had a real job, he always had a studio somewhere in the house, in the basement, in a spare bedroom. Uh, and he never really developed it as far as he wished he could but he instilled in me the love to do it. And I grew up as a little kid with all of his artwork and that's what inspired me to do it. So, uh, you know, in some ways, there's no one more influential than the first.
<laughs> yes, the dog. I see your dog. I see your dog is waiting. Come here, waiting. Jack. Sorry. Come here, come here, buddy. Here he is. Hi. My buddy. <laughs> no, he said, no, no, I don't want, I don't want, I want to go up. <laughs> Thanks. Um, a big hi to all your family. Hi to Al Jaffe and all uh, your colleagues. And thank you again. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.